Shalom. In this week's Torah portion of Re'e, C, Moses continues his intensive preparation of the people of Israel to enter into the land and in general to appreciate the land's sanctity and he further emphasizes the importance of performing the commandments in the land, removing all traces of idolatry from the land and exercising extreme caution against being led astray by any form of idolatry. The portion begins with these verses, See, I present before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing that you will heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse if you will not heed the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn away from the way I command you this day to follow other gods which you did not know. And it will be when the Lord your God will bring you to the land to which you come to possess it, that you shall deliver the blessing upon Mount Gerizim and the curse upon Mount Avel. Are they not on the other side of the Jordan, way beyond in the direction of the sunset, in the land of the Canaanites who dwell in the plain opposite Gilgal, near the plains of Moreh? For you are crossing the Jordan to come to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall possess it and dwell in it. And you shall keep to perform all the statutes and ordinances that I am setting before you today. And that's that. It's all about keeping the mitzvot in the land and not changing them. It's a fundamental principle that the Torah is God's will and will not be changed or canceled or replaced, not entirely and not even in the slightest detail. Thus we read here in the beginning of chapter 13, everything I command you that you shall be careful to do it. You shall neither add to it nor subtract from it. So one of the questions that this week's Torah portion deals with is, what happens if a prophet of God, presumably, comes along and instructs Israel to worship any form of idolatry? Or even, for that matter, to change the slightest detail of the commandments? As part of Moshe's preparation for his people, he warns them about a false prophet. And so we read, beginning in verse 2, If there will arise among you a prophet, or a dreamer of a dream, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder of which he spoke happens, and he says, Let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us worship them. You shall not heed the words of that prophet or that dreamer of a dream, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you really love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall follow the Lord your God, fear Him, keep His commandments, heed His voice, worship Him, and cleave to Him. And that prophet or that dreamer of a dream shall be put to death because he spoke falsehood about the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and who redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the way in which to lead you astray, from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to go, so shall you clear away the evil from your midst. All this is amazing. It's a strange idea. A prophet comes along, provides a real sign that comes true, but is obviously or apparently, not so obviously, false, having sought through the strength of this uh, sign or wonder or dream that came true, having sought to lead people astray from God. So how are we to understand this? Perhaps by way of introduction, it would be beneficial to understand what a prophet is. Some people think a prophet is just spokesmen or agitators. Most people understood the role of the biblical prophet to be a person who, by merit of righteousness, piety, separation, and training, and in truth all four are needed, this person becomes some kind of vessel for the divine. Now I must insert at this point that nowadays lots of people seem to consider themselves to be prophets. I know this because they tell everyone, some of them write books and have television shows, 
very profitable. And then there are all those who claim to be prophets because I know because they send me Facebook messages with dire warnings. They leave very offensive comments on my YouTube videos. And in general, they express themselves in talkbacks that could only be called pathological. Are these people true prophets? First of all, as far as being prophets of the God of Israel is concerned, with all due respect, with the exception of Bilaam and his donkey, who saw more than him, all the biblical prophets, without exception, are Jews. Second of all, let's try to get some perspective here. Actual, full-fledged prophecy like it once was is no longer extant in this world, though we do believe that it's on the way back. In the meantime, there are most certainly, absolutely, definitely levels of what can be called divine inspiration that people who are righteous, pious, separate, and trained can experience. But let's understand the word Navi, a prophet, and what it's all about. First of all, in English, the word prophet, according to the dictionary, a prophet is a person regarded as an inspired teacher or a proclaimer of the will of God. As in the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah, synonyms being seer, soothsayer, teller, clairvoyant, oracle. Another definition tells us it's a person who speaks for God or a deity, or by divine inspiration, or a person chosen to speak for God and to guide the people of Israel. Now, remember that everything is about the Hebrew. What is the meaning of the Hebrew word Navi, Nun, Bet, Yud, Aleph? And there is so much here. So let's just touch upon it on some level. First of all, on one level, the word shares the same root as a word Niv, as in Isaiah 57, 19. I create the speech of the lips sometimes translated there as the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace for the far and near. That verse, the use of the same root there, it would indicate that the main connotation of this word indeed is spokesman, especially for God. However, it can also mean a spokesman in general, such as, Aaron, your brother, shall be your prophet, we find in Exodus chapter 7, verse 1. So, in this view, Nava, which means to prophesize, it refers primarily, apparently, to the verbal expression of the revelation that the person is getting. But others maintain, other authorities maintain, that the main connotation of the word Navi is a channel through which the spiritual force can flow. And thusly, the word is related to the Hebrew Bo, meaning come or bring. And according to this understanding, the main ability of the prophet is to bring spiritual power, channeling it where it is needed. According to some of the greatest authorities of the Hebrew language, it's, re it's related to nava, which means flowing or gushing forth like a spring or a fountain. And this too has a connotation of expression and communication because the navi, the prophet, is one who can gush forth with spirit communicating with the divine and expressing the will of God. Another closely related word is biv or navuv, both meaning hollow, as in the verse that we find in Job chapter 11 and verse 12, a hollow man will gain hearts. This is a reference to the concept that a prophet would have to be a person who totally hollows himself out, as it were, emptying himself of all ego so that, like an empty pipe, he makes himself a channel for the Divine Spirit. Such a person would then be on the level of King David, who said of himself in the book of Psalms, my heart is hollow within me, Psalms 109.22. Because David, according to tradition, had totally killed his ego, and the same must be true of any prophet before such a person can become a vessel for the Divine. Now, this type of philo philological analysis, the derivation of the word and the connection of the roots, it's very interesting and important. But when we actually look at the context of how the word is used, we can get a clearer picture 
And we can see at once that nava, meaning to prophesy, means much more than just speaking out in God's name. Check out Ezekiel's vision of the Valley of the Dry Bones. Now, before these bones were resurrected and brought back to life, God told the prophet Ezekiel, Prophesy to the spirits, prophesy, son of man, and say to the spirit, Thus says the Lord God, From the four winds come, O spirit, and blow into these corpses that they should live. Ezekiel 37, verse 9. God is not telling Ezekiel here to be a spokesman or to predict the future. God is telling Ezekiel to channel spiritual force energy into these dead bodies. And that spiritual force that a true prophet can summon is so great that it has the power to bring the dead back to life. These are incredible concepts, earth shattering. But remember, that in the context of our discussion here in our Torah portion this week, we're dealing here in chapter 13 of Parshat A with a false prophet, a fake. The fact that he seeks to draw others astray from the one true God and his Torah is proof that he's a false prophet. The signs and wonders or dreams that he performs and comes true are not proof of anything. I don't know where he's getting his power from, and there are individuals that have such powers. There are such people in the world that can predict events and before whom things that are not known to others are revealed. So what? People use this power to their advantage to manipulate others and spread false ideas and set themselves up as prophets. But now that we understand a little bit more about what a Navi, what a true prophet is, we have an obvious question. And the question is, why would the Torah use this word here in our portion about someone who is a fake? <laughs> now that I know what a Navi is, and that he has the ability to channel God's own pure spirit, I mean, this is a person who wants to influence others to seduce them to worship idolatry, and the Torah calls him a Navi. And also, I ask, how can it be that he brings about signs and wonders? He gives them a sign and it comes true. Can this be a person who denies God himself and seeks to lead others astray to idolatry? It's all kinds of idolatry in the world, remember, all kinds of fakes. The Torah itself provides the remarkable answer, so powerful and simple and beautiful, and it's right here. And here's the answer. We read it. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love Hashem your God with all your heart and with all your soul. What is that? See, even in today's world, when the full nature of the prophetic experience is still hidden, there are people who, either by the strength of their special abilities, or perhaps more commonly, simply through charisma and the sheer force of their cult of personality, they become leaders, become religious leaders. They're our inspiration. They become political figures. But are they bringing us closer to, to our purpose, which is God's purpose? Are they bringing us closer to our connection to God, strengthening, bringing us closer to God, or away? Because our service of God meaning our life, the stuff of our everyday life, is not about a person. Serving God is never about a person or a master. Our teachers, hopefully we should merit to find good and righteous and holy teachers, they can and should be special and holy, and we need them if they are real. But God wants to know if we love Him with all our hearts and all our souls. It's about him. It's not about the little wizard behind the curtain making the pyrotechnics. And that's the nature of this test. What kind of a test is it? It's very unique. Do we love, are we capable of loving the one God who has no form and who cannot be manifest in any image and who cannot be conjured or manipulated by any man? The attribute that we need to love this God, it takes a lot of strength. It's true love. So 
the question that this fake presents to us, and we all have them in our lives, by the way, are we simply swayed, dazzled, starstruck, under the influence of a person, or do we really love God himself, with no intermediary or need for any impresario? The test is not about putting Israel's faith to the test, but about presenting Israel with an opportunity to reveal true faith and the power of that faith. The power of Israel's faith is very, very deep in their hearts. It doesn't need to be proven through signs and wonders. Because seeing and hearing is not a measuring rod for determining the truth. We've seen enough to last forever. For Hashem is testing you. And this test is true for you. It's true for every moment of every individual's life. The test is real. Don't accept imitations. Phonies, circus barkers, or ventriloquists, great men, holy men, prophets may come along and say, you're doing it wrong. There are other ways of doing it. But those ways, not only do you know in your heart that they go against everything that's holy and everything that God himself declares to be holy, but they prove their positions through all sorts of signs and wonders. And this presents us with an opportunity to demonstrate just what true love for God is, true dedication to God, and to reveal this innate power of faith in the one true God.